So last um, last time it was I guess it was uh, a month ago now. We were looking at spiritual warfare. Um, really, that was one of the most meaningful messages that I've ever given uh, because I kind of some things I just kind of shied away from uh, talking about, and uh, I think it's good to to not avoid things as a pastor, but to actually focus on it. Um, so we're going to look at two uh, two passages here. The first is in First Corinthians, and the second one's in Ephesians. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Now, if you don't remember last time we talked about spiritual warfare, we talked about praying for people, not focusing on casting things out, but instead just praying for people. And uh, we talked about uh, the way that we're not told to bind, to bind or cast out except with demonic possession. We're not called to just find you know, demons behind every, every rock and everything. Uh, we also looked at the way that it's, not everything is Satan's fault. You know, we're, we're masters of kind of, well, Satan maybe we do it. Well, no. Uh, some, Satan uses what's there, but he can't force you to sin. You know, it's like uh, in Ephesians, Paul says, you know, be angry if you must, but don't sin in your anger. And then like five verses later, he says, stop being angry. So I think that uh, we kind of just missed the, the hole there. Um, so we talked about the way that we are at war with our old nature. Um, and then we looked at the way that Satan is looking for opportunities to destroy us. Um, yeah. So, and then we, uh, we also talked about not seeing people as the enemy. That was a really big point that I hope you remember. People are not our enemy. We don't pray against people. We don't try to beat people over the head. We don't try to, we don't do that, right? We don't do that. Um, so, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-11. through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be, now, what he's saying here is you, you need to be saved in order to go to heaven. Jesus is the only way is basically what he's saying. And then he's saying some people pretend like they are saved, but they don't actually live their life for, God's, for God. They live their life for themselves. So that's a sign that you're not really saved if you're not really saved. Um, submitting your life to him. Now, he's not saying you will not have struggles anymore. He's not saying that. He, Paul acknowledged the fact that people have struggles. What he's saying here is people who live unrighteously. That's their goal in life. Okay. Remember before you were saved how you used to live for the weekends, spend all your money on, al on alcohol, and then you went back to work on Monday? Remember that life? That's what he's talking about. Where it's all about you. So, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Basically what he says is, is we were a bunch of sinners, but that's not who we are anymore. Okay? So let's look at some of the things that he mentions. Homosexuality, people, that, that's like, some, some Christians, that's the only one in this list that they pay attention to. There's all kinds of other things they just don't even pay attention to. Let's, let's focus on those other things. Uh, sexually immoral. Um, idolaters. This is someone who worships or participates in the worship of, uh, of false gods. What did you have to do with it? <laughs> Uh, nor adulterers, this would be people who um, obviously are unfaithful. Uh, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, um, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, one heart of you know, God. So kind of remember to keep those things in, in balance here. And then if we look at Ephesians 6, we kind of see it like this. It's okay for me to have sex outside of marriage. It's okay for me to gossip and complain. It's okay for me to do these things that are my things. But then there's these other sins that really are a big no-no. God's not going to have any kind of patience for those kinds of people. Homosexuals, for instance. God just wants to wipe them off the face of the earth. And, and you know, it's okay that I'm struggling with my thing, but they can't struggle with their thing. And so I think, once again, there needs to be a little more balance there. All sin separates us from God. And God's not pleased when we allow any sin in our lives. Okay, So let's kind of remember not to get too off balance with that. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18. This was the verse we looked at last time, and I kind of want to use it for tonight as well. 
Um, it says there in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. We talked about this is not a literal pair of armor. This is He's helping them draw a symbolism from this so that they can uh, understand what he's talking about. Um, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities. That, that word there, wrestle, it's an intense um, combating. It's not a passive thing. It's an intense, in-your-face kind of thing, okay? Um, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness um, given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet. Did, did you know that there are some people here who are facing some things that are that is definitely Satan trying to shoot fiery darts at you? And do you know what's going to prevent it is faith, the shield of but faith, when you continue to trust in God, even though everything, everything around you is giving you excuses not to. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all per, uh, perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Um, so... Somewhere along the lines of reading in 1 Corinthians, for instance, where it says, you know, not to participate in idolatry, somewhere along the lines there, we, we draw some strange, strange uh, conclusions. Basically, the idea is this. Since we're free from the law, that means there is no law over me, so I can live immorally. That's what people say. That's not, I'm not condoning this. I'm saying that's what people say. So it's okay for me to have idols in my house because, well, I'm free from the law. And so we're going we're to look at that, okay? It's, um, people along this line of thinking, they say things along this, along this. It's okay to own idols. It's okay for them to play with Ouija boards. It's okay to rebel, rebel against authority. These are things that, hey, it's not going to hurt me because I'm free in Christ, so I'm, I'm above and beyond the law, which has a certain truth to it. Yes, we are no longer held to the law. However, that doesn't mean that there is no such thing as right and wrong. That doesn't mean that there is no morality left. Okay, so let's keep this in mind. And Genesis 35, 2, I think, is a great place to kickstart this. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. See, Christians nowadays argue something along the lines of this. I don't worship the idol, so it's okay for it to be in my house. So Jacob said to his household, to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. This is something called consecration. Um, in the Old Testament, it carried an idea of purifying your household, purifying yourself for the purpose of being set apart for God. And in this consecration, you didn't stop worshiping the idols. You got rid of the idols in your household. You didn't own them. Okay? Because to create an idol is the same as to own an idol. Okay? So I, we somehow we got this disconnect. So I want to kind of try piecing these things together because this tonight we're going to talk about this, the part about spiritual warfare that I avoided last time. We're going to talk about the demonic stuff. Okay. Um, so the first thing, what is a demonic stronghold? You talk, you hear people talk about this. You know, uh, Satan's got a stronghold. Well, it's it's something I'm going to see in a little bit more simplified terms here. People or communities. Where Satan has gained influence. Now, on the on this on the slide here, I'm going to show you some examples. If you can go to that, that first point there, um, uh, religion is one way that Satan g gains a foothold. He convinces people that if they just do all the right things, that God will then accept them. So while we get sidetracked on being perfect, um, Satan is able to beat us down with that guilt and, and shame, and you're never going to be good enough. And we completely miss what God is trying to do. See what I mean? You hear a lot of atheists, for instance, talk about, about religion, and I kind of see where they're coming from. Religion is a bad thing. But that relationship with Christ, that goes beyond just simply, I go to church, and I give my money and tithes, and I'm a good person overall. It goes to the heart of who we are. Okay. Another way that Satan does this is through the occult. Things like tarot cards, Ouija boards. 
uh, dream catchers and kachina dolls, things that we convince ourselves are harmless. And so we allow them into our house and we allow them to have influence in our lives. Um, horror movies are another great example. But the truth is that these are just another way that God, that Satan is trying to trying to tear us down. Okay, and we need to be very careful about this. Um, bad attitudes, also alongside bad attitudes, uh, mental problems, uh, physical problems, you know, sicknesses and those kinds of things. They all kind of work together. Uh, where when Satan sees the opportunity, he 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 storms at it. Remember what the Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion. He's just waiting. He's just waiting to tear us apart. Okay, he's looking for his opportunity. Um, addictions, this is another one, um, uh, where, you know, we're trying to get out of something that we've done for so long, we just don't think we can give it up. We just don't think we can. It's impossible to give this thing up. I'll never get over it. You know, you see a lot of people who are just uh, hopeless in their situations. You know, me and my wife, we're going to get a divorce. You know, I've been looking at pornography for so long, I don't think I'll ever get out of it. Well, I've been drinking every single night before I went to bed for years. I don't think I'll ever stop drinking. You know, these addictions that, that, that Satan uses uh, to keep us away from being more um, beneficial Christians. So, and then other such things like that. Um, so that's what, a demonic, that's what a demonic stronghold is. It's people or communities where Satan has gained influence. Okay? Um, so that brings us to the question, so does every sin equally submit us to Satan's strongholds? No. There's, there's, I personally worked out a three, three tier system just for the sake of, of making things easier to understand, okay? Um, I don't want you to read too far into this. This is just to help you, okay? Some things bring more severe uh, results. So on the first, on the first there, a little notch there, would be, would be stumbling, okay? This would be something that you just messed up, okay? Yes, yeah, Satan is going to seize the opportunity to make it you know, wreck bad attitudes to wreck relationships, those kinds of things. He absolutely will work in it. But ultimately, it's not going to leave that big of an impact. You just repent and you keep moving forward. These are things like an outburst of anger. Okay, you, you mess up. You know, it's not the end of the world. You just get up and go go again. Um, a, uh, a temporary relapse. Uh, we deal with a lot of drug addicts. And a lot, and a lot of things is they, they have this, this idea in their head where if they mess up once, if they ever go back to it, God's just not going to love them. Well, newsflash, if God loved you through all those years of, of your rebellion, he's going to still love you if you make a mistake. See what I mean? So that's like the, the first tier. Then there's the second tier. This is intentionally living in sin. This is doing things like gossiping. This is a step worse than just, whoops, I messed up. This is something that really tears people apart. When we gossip and complain, when we backbite, when we become masters of what's wrong with everybody else, but we don't let God change us. Now, I put this on level two because it doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be a thing that we can repent from it and, and move past. Or it can go to the other extreme and kill our spiritual life, whatever we allow it to do. You can either submit to God or not submit to God. It, it's, it's not the end of the road, but it definitely points to that if you continue that life habit, okay? Then there's the third layer, which is which is really kind of uh, a dangerous place to be in. This is the hardness of heart. Um, you can go to the next point there, but uh, this is hardness of heart, direct rebellion to God. This is where you've become so hurt, you lived in sin for so long, that you're actually to the stage of justifying it, saying, you know, it's okay for me to do this, because you know, it's just, it's just not that big of a deal. See what I mean? And, uh, uh, good examples of that, uh, rebelling against authority. Well, it's different because I'm smarter than the pastor. You see worship leaders do this a lot. You see worship leaders do this a lot. I'm so much more spiritual than the pastor, so I'm going to go somewhere else because he's just not as spiritual as me. You see a lot of worship leaders do that. In fact, Pastor and I were just talking about this this week. Most of the time, if you are a worship leader, you will eventually struggle with this in your life. Most of the time. Um, you see, uh, you see, kids do this a lot with their with their adult with their parents. You see, people nowadays doing a lot with the government and whatnot. Where we've reached a place of just, it's okay to be rebellious towards everything. And uh, remember, God did definitely place those authorities over us. And it might not seem like this is such a big thing, but in First Samuel, we're going to look at that a little bit. The prophet Samuel actually equates 
rebellion as equal to witchcraft. So I think that that's worth considering. You know, uh, probably not a good idea to do things like that. So then um, another example of this would be would, well witchcraft. I, mean, I brought it up. I go on hand in hand with that. And what we do is we excuse it. It's not that big of a deal. Ouija boards aren't really that bad. It's okay. I have a kachina doll in my house, but it's not that big of a deal. So I mean, we do things where we excuse it in our lives because it's us who are doing it. See, we this is us in our hearts. We don't say this, but this is actually how we think. I want God to be merciful to me, and I want him to strike everybody else down. That's just kind of how we think. We tend to be overjudgmental when it's from the else, but then when it's us, we find loopholes in how it's okay for us. And uh, anyways, so how do you break down these strongholds that Satan erects? These people and communities that have, have gained, where Satan has gained influence, how do you revert that? How do you, how do you break that down? And there's, there's actually a few ways that the Bible directly tells us. Um, the first way that the Bible so, shows us is the Word of God. Not just reading it, but also meditating on it and thinking on it. But then also the proclamation of the Gospel, preaching the Word. Okay? If you look in the book of Acts, how many cities the apostles went to. And if you notice, they didn't go into demonic realms and say, I cast out the demon of the city, we're all good. No, they went in and preached Christ and him crucified. And that set people free. And that's how you break satanic uh, 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 strongholds, is with the word of God. Second off, uh, there's prayer. And you know, prayer breaks chains of addiction, it, cha it breaks chains of, of bondage. In Luke uh, 4, 18 through 19, uh, Jesus goes to the to the um, temple, and he says, uh, reads a passage from Isaiah. I'll actually just read it. It's in Luke chapter four. Uh, you're welcome to turn there if you want to. Luke chapter four, verse eighteen through nineteen. He says this: The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has uh, sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set out liberty to those who are oppressed, and to pr proclaim the fear of the Lord's favor. And uh, that's kind of the heart of prayer. It's getting on God's page. It uh, prayer really does break break chains in our lives. You know, if you're struggling with something, just go to the Lord in prayer. And don't and pastors talked about this to great lengths. Don't do those prayers where you go for a minute or two and. That's just it. No, get into prayer. I mean, go and just get alone. Turn off your cell phones. Go somewhere where it's, people won't bother you. And just talk to God from your heart. See what I mean? And you'll know when you're done when it's finished. And then the next day, go and do the same thing again. See, if we don't have an active prayer life, we will not be overtaking Satan in our lives. Because Satan, every second of every day, is seeking to destroy us. God, every second of every day, is seeking to expand his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And so that leaves us in the middle. Well, I don't, I'm not crazy about the whole religious thing. So, I mean, I go to church on Sunday. So, I mean, well, that's exactly where Satan wants you. He wants you, the pastor talked about this this morning, he wants you where you feel comfortable. He wants you where you feel comfortable. Satan oftentimes isn't just going to um, pressure you to abandon the faith. He's going to get you to do things that you know are wrong. And then after you've justified them for a long time, you're, you're going to start to get a hardness in your heart. See how that works? And then as that hardness grows, you eventually make the decision all by yourself to abandon God. That's how it works. But Satan at first will just seek to sidetrack you with things. Those fiery darts that he shoots at us. Um, so then the third thing that, um, that, that breaks strongholds is holiness. This is, it can be defined as not living according to the world's ways. Choosing to set yourself apart from things even though everybody you know is doing them. I know a lot of friends who watch a lot of movies that I don't want anything to do with. Because I feel like I shouldn't. See what I mean? I'm not trying to impose my way of life onto you. I'm just saying this. I pray the Holy Spirit. I feel like the Holy Spirit genuinely spoke. 
and I genuinely listen. It's that simple. You don't have to play games with God. You, you, you pray to the Lord yourself. He will show you things to give up, and then just listen to him when he does. It, I mean, it's not... It's, we, we complicate it a lot of times, and, and to make matters worse, a lot of times televangelists kind of don't help. You know, we turn on the TVs, and they're talking about all these things that they can send you that will do these things if you give so much of a donation, all these different things. It's not that complicated. God is a God who hears and answers. Stay in the Word, stay in prayer, God will answer you. That's who God is. God is not a God who's far off and hides himself. From you. You know, he's a God who, when he walked, in the beginning, he walked with Adam and Eve. Then, then when they abandoned him, he revealed himself to them. See what I mean? And then when people started worshiping other gods, he revealed his perfect law. See what I mean? And I'm not talking about the law that, of Moses. That, that was faulty. I'm talking about his will that was revealed through the law. Okay? Uh, when, when, G, when people killed the prophets, he sent Jesus. When they killed Jesus, he sent the Holy Spirit. See what I mean? Like, this is the God we're talking about. Do you honestly think that God would endure all of that and then would give up on you so quickly after thousands of years of, of this grand plan that he's been working through? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. God is a God who hears, and he's a God who answers when we seek. Okay. So then the fourth thing of how we break strongholds, spiritual strongholds in our lives, in our community, we trust in God. And it sounds overly simplistic. I totally admit that. I, I get that. It does sound too simple. But it is that simple. Trust in God. When, when everything falls apart around you when, you, when you don't have the finances, you don't know how you're going to make it for the next month. And when you feel like giving up, trust in God. Because that faith is like a shield which protects you from Satan's fiery darts. The fifth thing, I can't say this enough, love. Love breaks Satan's grip on people. I, I don't know how that works, man. I wish I had a complete Michael's guide to understanding everything of God, but we don't have that. We'll never fully understand God. I mean, we're just, we're mortal beings. And it's not like we can understand everything about God. But he showed us what he wants us to know. Okay? He showed us what he wants us to know. And we just have to lean on face with that. So this is where I want to come back to this. People are not the enemy. A lot of times Christians have been known, sadly, for justifying things like righteous anger. But I want to point this out. Even if your anger is justified, you are angry about something that is genuinely immoral. That doesn't give you the right to act immorally. What we do is we, we, we say something like this. I have a righteous anger, so therefore I'm going to disres be disrespectful to authority. I'm going to be bitter towards this person. I want you to see something in Ephesians. And I want you to, uh, to remember this because this is something that blew my mind away. It's in Ephesians, I want to say it's chapter 4. Probably around 20, verse 21. Well, now I can't find it. Okay, 25. There it is. Verse 25, not 21. Sorry. Uh, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Then verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Now, the verb here is actually, this part blew me away. It's actually called an imperative verb. That means it's a command. It's telling you to do something. Be angry, which doesn't make sense until you read the rest of the verse. And do not sin. Whoa, wait, what? And do not sin. And then here in verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me be angry, then you're telling me don't be angry? Because it's, it's, it doesn't translate well in your Bibles, but 
I'll kind of reword it to where it fit in my, more of an English current, because this was written in Greek, remember. He's saying something along the lines of this. If you must be angry, go ahead and get angry, since you're so hell-bent on being angry. But don't <coughs> sin in that anger. And then a few verses later, he even clarifies, don't be angry. Just in case you missed what he was saying in verse 25, which is a good thing, because in English it doesn't translate well. In English it says this, be angry and do not sin. Which means, hey, I can get angry as much as I want. But anger leads to sin. Yeah, absolutely. So we're left with kind of a conundrum there, aren't we? Until verse 31 comes along, along and he says, oh yeah, and don't be angry. Ah, I see what you're saying now. Once again, things are lost in translation. There is no such thing as a perfect translation. There isn't. Uh, you're going to get a fuller understanding of the word by just studying. I mean, that's really all I can say. Anyways, so... Um, Love. And then the last thing that I want to mention is the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. And Acts it records disciples who really have no direction. And then the Holy Spirit comes. And then 3,000 people get saved in one day. See what I mean? That's how you break the power of the enemy and your community and your lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So. I'm going to take a slight detour for a second and talk about the demonic. There are a lot of movies out there who have given a very weird idea about the demonic. And so I kind of want to bring some of that back down to earth. If you've ever seen movies like The Exorcist, people who are demon-possessed look really creepy and stuff. But the truth is, people who are demon-possessed usually just look like people. Exactly. Usually, you're not going to say that person's demon-possessed. You know, it's not, it's not like that, you know? Or they're, they're, they're bending over backwards and, you know, their heads rotating. It doesn't really work like that. I mean, yes, with demonic situations, there are times when people exhibit things, you know, odd behavior, um, speaking in other tongues, uh, superhuman strength, those kinds of things, those do happen, okay? I'm, I'm not going to lie to you on that. But demons those people don't just walk around like, ah, you know, it's not, it's not like that. Um, they don't live in dark houses with poor lighting or where the windows are all fogged up. That's, that's fantasy, okay? <laughs> It's just fantasy. Oftentimes, people get involved with demons when they don't even mean to. And I think that that's part of the reason why I want to take this little detour. So first off, what are demons? They are simply fallen angels. Let's not over-glorify them. They're fallen angels. They are angels that God created, and then they chose to rebel when Lucifer led his rebellion, and so they got cast out of heaven. That's all the demon is. They have some power, yes, limited power. However, all their power is subject to God. Are they more powerful than us? Yes, they are more powerful than us, without God. But with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing you have to be afraid of. Christians have, there's nothing that Christians should be afraid of with the demonic. I'm not saying, go play with the demons. I'm not saying that. In fact, I'm going to clarify that in just a second. Um, uh, Satan and Jesus are not brothers. Sa uh, Satan is an angel, a fallen angel, and Jesus is God, fully God. So... You know, that's another myth that cults got going. Uh, people do not become angels when they die. Um, we, well, our spirits go to heaven, and then at the end, w with the resurrection of the saints, we become, the, the first Corinthians says, we put on the new, okay? So what that means is that our earthly body is, um, I don't know how, how to say it, uh, reinvented, it's um, reimagined. We become something new. All sin is taken away from us, and we're not left with the same struggles as we dealt with on the earth. Okay? Um, obviously, there's much more that could be said. There's much more that has been said, but luckily it's all in here, so I don't have to detail it. Um, people don't become angels. There is no such thing as ghosts. There are such things as demons who present themselves to scare people according to the myths that they believe. Does that make sense? No such thing as ghosts. Demons can show themselves in ways to scare people. There are no such things as ghosts. The Bible says that once you die, you are you are with God. That's it. There's no second life. There's no reincarnation. There's You are in heaven, on earth one minute, and as soon as you die, you're in the spiritual realm. That's There's no limbo. There's none of that stuff. The Bible is abundantly clear on this. Um, there's no such thing as ghosts. Satan doesn't have a son. That's another myth that got going, that Satan had, you know, you know, the son of Satan and everything. Um, Satan doesn't have the ability to create. 
He has the ability to mess with what God has created as long as God allows him to. However, he doesn't have the ability to create. Um, and demons obviously don't have sex, so they can't reproduce like that either. So on both accounts, he doesn't have a son. Um, and demons don't have infinite power. This is something that, that, did you know that demons lie about themselves? Did you know that? They'll lie to people about their backgrounds and stuff. A lot of times in seances, they'll appear to people as people that they once knew. But did you know that people aren't really talking to their dead relatives? They're talking to a demon who's pretending to be a dead relative. Did you know that? That's how seances work. They present themselves, and I'm actually going to show you the biblical proof of that too. Um, so um, there are many things that torment us. There's the effects of the fall. This is, you know, we get sick, we die, the effects of the fall. Um, there are choices that we make, which some of them are bad, and so that comes back on us. There's temptations that Satan brings by to destroy us, and then there's testing that God brings by to grow us in character. Okay? Um, but God can use all these things to, things to his glory. Um, John 10.10 10 says, um, The enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy, but I come that you might have life, and that more abundantly, to a greater degree than you, even you know. Not one day, right now I want to give you life more abundantly. For you to walk in power now. Okay? Christians are not just waiting out the end of the world. You know? um, okay. Uh, just a few things I want to mention there. Um, I have, there are stories of, of Christians going into places that they were not adequately spiritually equipped for and things happening like being paralyzed. So that brings up the question, do demons have powers over Christians? No. Um, if Christians are not adequately equipped for things, uh, Satan in his realm is more able to have an impact on us and oppress us, but they cannot possess us. Does that make sense? As Christians, because the Holy dwells in us. However, I wouldn't recommend taking a brand new Christian to a very demonic place. Because they're not strong enough yet in their faith. Does that make sense? And I'm not just making these stories up. Um, you know, I, I personally know these people where, you know, they went to the, into places where, the, where there was demonic strongholds and they were paralyzed. I've heard stories of Christians who were young Christians still, yes, but who were paralyzed and, and couldn't move um, in, in beds, in, in cars, different things like that. But I thought they served God, yes, but still there's Satan, once again, does have power on this earth. Okay? He's on complete control. Remember that God is always in complete control, but he does have power on this earth, and he can impact things. What I want you to get out of this is don't play with the demonic. Don't play with the demonic. Um, Christians cannot be possessed, but they can be oppressed. I just said that. Uh, even more so as they allow. Sometimes we want to try and play with the demonic without receiving the effects of the demonic. I want to watch movies that glorify the demonic, like The Exorcist, for instance, and I don't want it to have any effect on me. Well, that's fantasy. Yeah. There's no such thing as you watching that kind of nonsense and it not affecting you. It's like saying, I want to go out and do cocaine every day and I don't want there to be any results. What? See, it just doesn't work like that. Um, so, there's no such thing as selling your soul to the devil. This is one that got popular, especially in the midst of a lot of Hollywood pop culture and all that. There is no such thing as selling your soul to the devil. That just doesn't exist. At any moment, Anyone can call on the name of the Lord and they will be saved. That's how simple it is. Satan is not stronger than Jesus' blood. He's not. Okay? So I would say that you do need to definitely confess your sins to God, verbally accept him, verbally confess, and I would highly recommend that you verbally and audibly renounce Satan. Satan, I renounce you and I no longer have anything to do with you. I am washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I would definitely say that. In fact, there are many well-documented, these are well-documented cases, and I can, I can give, you, give you links and whatnot to get you started. In fact, let me say to the time, go and get a book by uh, Walter Martin. It's called Kingdom of the Occult. That's a good place to start, and they have plenty of links in there for you to follow. Okay? i uh, save you a lot of time there. Um, okay, so with demonic possession, you don't have to control... I'm sorry, let me, let me say it differently. You often believe that you are in control with demonic possession, but you aren't. See, what happens is we start wetting our toes in the demonic realm, and we, we start, it, slowly you start giving up your freedoms, giving up your, 
who you are, and, and demons kind of get more of a foothold in our lives. Non-Christians. Non-Christians. Of course, if you're a Christian and you're delving into the demonic, then, you know, the same thing applies, I guess. Um, and then there reaches a point where you just have less and less control, and the demons have, we see this in the Gospels, where the, the person was being thrown into the fire, for instance. With the, the raving madman that had terrorized the villages, that he, he was just going around, he was just crazy, you know what I mean? Now, I'm not saying every time that somebody's crazy or senile is a demon, I'm not saying that. Um, but, you know, we definitely see, see that model uh, with, with demonic activity, okay? Um, so it, it's a gradual thing that happens. Uh, demons can be cast out against the person's wishes. I'm not going to say whether this is a smart thing to do or not, because Jesus said that if you cast out a demon and nothing else goes in, then the demons will come back even more powerful, and it'll be worse than it was for them at the first. So, I mean, once again, I would question the wisdom of casting somebody out against, I mean, casting demons out um, apart from the person's wishes, but it is possible. Um, <clears throat> And one thing I want to mention is that Satan has us convinced it's okay to let evil in our households because we're Americans. <laughs> Acts 19.19 19 is a great example of this. Um, it says this, uh, And a number of those who had practiced magic arts, witchcraft, uh, brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Why did they throw that out? Well, because they got saved. But why did they throw it out? Can't you keep the demonic things in your household if you're saved? See, the Bible shows us very clearly everywhere in Scripture that you cannot keep demonic things in your household and serve God. But I don't worship it anymore. You cannot keep demonic things in your household and serve God. It, it doesn't matter if we serve it or not. It matters that it's, in, that it's part of our things. And then 1 Timothy 4 1 kind of touches on this. You know, I don't really want to spend too much time here, but I'll mention it nevertheless. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to what? Deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. That's exactly what's happened with a lot of these things. Um, a lot of these things we've allowed in our households. You know, uh, who do you think? came up with the idea that Jesus isn't really God. Satan. That's called the doctrine of the devil. Okay, there's a lot of cults that have made this kind of a main theme. Oh, no, no, he's God. He's just not the same as God the Father. Oh, he's not really God. He's just a good prophet, a good person, whatever. See what I mean? A, an a, a God among many, yeah, that's another variation of that. Um, these are doctrines of the devil. Um, Kachina dolls, dream catchers, these are also. And we're going to look specifically at what are these things meaning have. So denying the influence of the demonic doesn't stop its influence. Just because I don't believe in demonic activity doesn't mean that there isn't demonic activity. That just means that I've closed my, my eyes to reality that is around me. Do you think that Satan is just passively sitting by while the church was goofing off with it, you know, years ago in this community? No, no, he was very clearly marking his territory. He was very clearly building things in the community. He was busy here. And now, the church is active again. And he's like, oh, well, I guess I have to tear people down again. Because he's done it before. He'll just do it again. See what I mean? That, that's his mindset. So what we have to do is we have to outlast the problems. Did I say that? Yes, I did. We have to outlast the problems. Satan isn't going anywhere. You know, he's, he doesn't die. Remember that. He doesn't have like 60 years in the war. No, he doesn't die. So, you know, he, he's, not, he's not going anywhere. We are going to have to face the problem. We can't hide ourselves from it. Um, and not all signs are from God. Satan can work um, signs that appear to be from God sometimes. False healings, for instance. Speaking in tongues. Demons can speak in tongues too, not the same speaking in tongues that, that are brought about by the Holy Spirit, but they do also do that. Demons love to try and um, blaspheme God. They love to do anything that will get the attention off of God. Never forget that. Just because you do not, you are not demon possessed, doesn't mean that you have not allowed demonic activity in your household. Okay, and I, I really want to really want to drive this home, drive this point home. Um, Deuteronomy 12. Anytime you're talking about demonic influence, you need to be reading Deuteronomy. 
in which I understand, once again, I understand that the law no longer applies uh, to us directly because we're not Jewish and we're not going into the promised land. I get that. However, I'm writing, did you know I'm writing an entire book on how the law applies to us today? Did you know I'm on page 204? Guess what I've been studying solely for the last year, as in nothing else? I've studied the law for many years, but in the past year I've studied nothing but the law. This is something that definitely does not require too much work to apply to our lives. Chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, uh, verse, I'm sorry, chapter 12. I said that totally wrong. I was about to read uh, Moses' death there. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12, oh, goodness sakes. Uh, verse uh, 32 all the way through 13.3. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. If a prophet arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, if the mighty work, the miracle that he said would happen, ha happens, and if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So there was a prophet, he gave signs and miracles, and it wasn't from God. See, that's kind of the golden rule in, in, in a, lot, a lot of times for us. Hey, if, 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 uh, you know, if, if he proves himself, and I can listen to everything that he says, I can just throw out the Bible. You know, we, have gifts of, we have gifts of the Holy Spirit in our church, why do I need to read the Bible? Well, I, I've read the Bible before. Why do I need to keep reading it? I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. Why do I need to go to church? That pastor's not even that great of a guy anyways. See, I mean, we start this gospel and complaining. We start telling ourselves how it's okay for us. We are the exception to the rule. And just that quickly, the demonic gets working in our lives. And I, I'm probably spending too much time. So let's go to, what do these things mean? First off, let's talk about Kachina dolls. Kachina dolls are actually images of spirit beings, images of gods. Now these gods have a lot of different things, uh, specific gods, elements, animals, or dead ancestors. And they were made uh, for, at different festivals for the purpose, now get this, they were made for the purpose of being set in the home to be studied. Because each Kachina doll was made that year at that festival from that god that revealed himself, or that spirit that revealed itself that year. Okay, And it was kept in the house, listen to this, okay? It was kept in the house for the purpose of being studied. So now Christians now are saying, hey, let's keep Kachina dolls in our house. What? It's just a decoration. It was just a decoration back then. That still doesn't make it any less stupid. They are images of spirits. In case you didn't catch it, the doctrine of the demon that 1 Timothy 4 1 was talking about, okay? We need to be really on our guard with this because here's the thing. Satan loves to catch us on tradition for the sake of overlooking God's vision. Do you understand what I just said? Yeah. Satan will keep us on our traditions, the things that we like, that we hold a preference for, over God's vision for the future. Do you understand that? And we excuse it because we want to excuse it. We excuse it because we're ignorant of what the word actually says. We excuse it because we're not staying in prayer. Okay. Um, okay, Exodus 20, uh, 3 through 6 actually talks about this. It's funny that, um, that Kachina dolls are so regularly excused in our culture when they are an immoral thing. Exodus chapter 20, verse, uh, what did I say? It was 3 through 6? Yeah, it was 3 through 6. You shall have no other gods before me. Owning an idol is having a god besides God, or in front of God, around God. Okay? You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. I didn't make it, I just bought it. What? <laughs> you want to go back and read Genesis 35 again? Um, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. So basically, don't make an image of anything. 
For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation, which is an encompassing term. It means on your whole household there will be pro trouble that comes. Okay? Three or four households in every generation is typically what existed in an Israelite household. So he's saying trouble will come on your whole household by you having idols. It's things like sickness. He, he specifically clears this out. I will bring sickness on you. You will have problems. I will take your blessings away. He specifically clears these, it says these things. If you participate with the idols that your culture is participating with, he specifically clears it out. Um, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commands. This is a way of saying I will show um, ongoing love. It's not literally to the thousand. God doesn't literally count 1,000 generations. He's saying I will show abundant goodness. Abundant goodness to those after you. So the, 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 the positiveness of our, of our seeking God. Okay, uh, let's go to the next thing. Dream catchers. Really popular out here. Goodness, sakes, these things are popular. Supposedly they have their influence with the uh, Chippewa... Um, let me, I wrote this down, Ojibwa, Chippewa people. I always, that first one always gets me. Um, it, there's some controversy as to where it came, but most people believe that this is where it actually came from. And it's basically a symbol for the spider woman who's a god, basically. There's, you can sugarcoat it, but that's basically what she is. Um, and she protects the tribes, but as the tribes grew and expanded out, she, she gave them the dream catcher as an image to bind them all together. Among Native American culture, it is still seen as a, a unifying force of the Native uh, tribes. However, recently it's actually become quite the controversy. Um, evidently, a lot of Native Americans aren't too happy about the idea that Americans, have kind of, or you know, Western people, whatever you want to say, um, have uh, made it more of a pop culture thing. And the dream catchers are now made with plastic and those kinds of things, which to Native Americans is kind of desecration, I guess you could say. Um, so, uh, and the idea is that um, this dream catcher was for the children. You would hang it on the tent, and uh, uh, it was decorated with sacred objects like feathers and beads. That still is pretty much kept in uh, modern culture, too. Uh, and it, 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 there's these dreams and, and different evil things that float around at, at night, and it, the dream catcher tracks them, and it catches the evil things, and it filters the good things down to the child. So this is demonic on two realms. First off, it's a symbol of, of, a, of, a demon, of a god, which is a demon. And then second off, it places our trust and our comfort in the hands of a demon. So it's wrong on two accounts. Dream catchers <coughs> might be, in my opinion, worse than Kachina dolls. It's hard to, hard to gauge it, but I mean, it has two verse one. I mean, I'm not great at math, but... Um, so... That takes us to Ouija boards. Now, the idea of a Ouija board, the sole purpose for its creation was in, in, to speak to the demonic realm. That, that's why it was created. A lot of people nowadays don't think that Ouija boards have any power. It's just a fun thing, whatever. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, you know, it's that fun movie that came out a few years ago. We, you know, I think it's actually called Ouija. Um, but anyways, and uh, so let's look at what First Samuel says about conjuring up the demonic realm. Uh, for, ch First Samuel chapter 15 uh, starting here in uh, 28. 1 Samuel 28. Looks like they never turned there. There we go. 1 Samuel 28. And this is where King Saul uh, goes to a medium, uh, as a, a witch, a witch uh, to get um, revelation from God because God's not speaking. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, Divine for me by his spirit, and bring up for me who, who, uh, whomever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, Surely you know that Saul, what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the necromancers from the land. Why then are you uh, laying a, a trap for my life to bring about my death? Verse 10. But Saul swore to her by the Lord as the Lord lives. No punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the, the woman said, See, Saul wasn't too good about following God's laws. God specifically said in the law, do not let a sorceress live. And, but Saul, who's above the law, you remember, he's got a special connection. Don't worry about it. No, no harm's going to come to you. So he goes to, the, to a witch. Then he gives the witch clearance over and above what God had told him to do. 
And then we get deeper on. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? He said, bring up Samuel for me. Now remember, in seances, the person doesn't actually appear because the Bible says we know where the spirit actually is, don't we? When, uh, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. Whoa, why did she cry out with a loud voice? Because it was actually Samuel who came. That wasn't supposed to happen. It was supposed to be a demon present, representing himself as Samuel. But that's not what happened. Samuel actually appeared. And she's like, whoa, what just happened? She cried out She cried, cried with a loud voice, and the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. Well, how did she know that? Because Samuel the prophet actually came up. Kind of a terrifying thing for her when she's used to dealing with demons. The king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see, I see a god coming up out of the earth. He said to her, what is his appearance? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is wrapped in a robe. See, this woman was holding a seance for the sake of Saul, who would no longer hear from God because he didn't like following God's ways. And God broke into the seance, and instead, he showed up rather than letting a demon show up. Pretty powerful stuff here. Um, so, with that being said, um, you can read the rest of the story there yourself, but the idea here is that um, the demonic is very much still active, and uh, Ouija boards are very much so not okay for us Christians to do. The Bible clearly says not to do things like the witchcraft and, the, and those kinds of different things. So that takes us to a last kind of broad thing. Horoscopes, fortune tellers, tarot cards. Tarot cards are supposedly cards that tell you about the future and that kind of stuff. Um, fortune tellers are similar. They're uh, psychics and those kinds of things. And uh, horoscopes, those are things that basically tell you the, what's going to happen based on your birth month, what you're more likely to do based on your birth month. Which I'm actually really surprised about because recently I've seen a lot of Christians doing horoscopes. And they all justify like it's not that big of a thing. But the Bible aligns that with witchcraft too. And we have to watch out even more so because New Mexico has a really high percentage of, of occult activity. More so than your average state. New Mexico is kind of, you would say, steeped in it. So all the more we should be watching out for not getting entangled up with these things. Right? You would, you would think, right? Um, so Deuteronomy 18, 9-14. Let me just say this. If God's done with you about something you know that you're wrong, that, that it's wrong, just stop doing it. Just stop doing it. For some reason, our first instinct is to say, no, it's okay. And we try to just justify ourselves. Just stop. It's not okay for you to do it. It's not okay for somebody else to do it. Just stop doing it. Okay? And Deuteronomy uh, 18, 9. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens, that would include tarot cards and horoscopes, um, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead, like, for instance, Ouija boards. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. Can I be a Christian and practice things like the Ouija board? It is an abomination to the Lord. If you're doing it, I would highly recommend that you stop doing it, and I would highly recommend that you get rid of it, um, preferably by burning. Uh, if you sell it, somebody else is just going to buy it. I wouldn't buy things for the purpose of burning it. That's just seems kind of foolish, but if you have it, I would highly recommend burning it, destroying it, no longer allowing Satan to have that uh, hold on your house. Um, okay, uh, was I going to read anything else from that? For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving out them, uh, driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God, for these nations which you are about to dispossess listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. Pretty simple. So uh, The Exorcist and other horror movies that, and whatnot like that. And I'm not saying the thrillers are wrong to watch. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying don't watch things that glorify evil. Don't watch things that glorify evil. And then, if you do, don't be surprised at the bad things. God specifically warned us in his word. When you do allow these things to happen, it's going to affect your third and fourth generation. It's going to affect how your kids sleep, how your kids act, how you feel, how you act. Oh, I just didn't get good sleep. 
So, uh, and these also uh, always open up other doors too. So freedom from, from the law doesn't destroy morality. Just because we're free from the law doesn't mean that we can just do whatever we want. So in closing, uh, first off, don't let Satan give, gain a foothold in your life. Don't let him do it through idols. Don't let him do it through rebellion. Don't let him, don't let him do it through gossiping and, gossiping and complaining. Don't let him do it through all your hardness of heart. Don't let him have a foothold in your, in your life. Surrender it to God and get over it. Because God wants you to mature and grow and move on. Uh, don't, don't let him gain a foothold in your life through pride. Especially if you're a guy. I know girls struggle with this too. But in my opinion, I think us guys kind of tend to give way to pride more so than girls. I think that we kind of, it's kind of our signature move. Women can't tell us what to do. You know what I mean? We know everything. It's kind of that pride. We want to have dominion over everybody else, and we don't want anybody else to tell us our business. It's our business. You know, this is that pride. Um, don't let him gain a, gain a foothold through witchcraft. You know, a lot of times you hear people say, I believe in Jesus, but which one? Which Jesus do you believe in? In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, G Paul warned, he said, people are, people are coming to you with a different Christ than the Christ that I came to you with. His character was different. His essence was different. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 talks about this when he says, um, let me just turn there, I want to actually read this one. Uh, Therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Pastor talked about this for a few weeks ago, so if you want more details specifically on this verse, you can talk to him, or you can just get a, a, a recording of the that message. Basically, the idea here is the idea of that. It's not necessarily Jesus is a curse. Those specific words, he's saying the idea of what's being said. Okay, you, you, you can't say things that are against the word of God by the power of God. And you can't say things that are the word of God by a different power. Does that make sense? That's kind of what he's talking about. Once again, I don't want to get too much out of that. And then in 1 John 2, 4, actually all throughout 1 John, he talks about you know, people are saying this about Jesus, but if, the, if, if, if they're not saying that he is fully God and that he actually came in flesh, then they are liars. And you can read through First John there, but he, he keeps talking about the actual Jesus versus the Jesus that you're hearing about. So I want you guys to genuinely question that because sometimes we say things like that. I believe in Jesus. Which Jesus do you actually believe in, though? If your Jesus is okay with adultery, if your Jesus is okay with witchcraft, if your Jesus is okay with gossiping and complaining, that's not Jesus. Remember that. Because Jesus isn't okay with you living in sin. He's not okay with that. Once again, we get familiar with things, and because we want to do things our way, we just kind of excuse ourselves. So, for the church to be effective, it can't live as the world. If the church... I actually like how I said it on this better. Go to the next next point there, buddy. Uh, if the church acts like the world, it ceases to be the church. It ceases to be the church. Because the church is supposed to be God's people. So if we're living our way, we're not God's people. See what I mean? Does that kind of make sense? Um, to honor God, we cannot honor ourselves or our culture. See, down here, we have a real problem. Because we can't... <laughs> Dream catchers, they're part of our culture down here. They are. And in fact, it's reached to the point that it's not even Native American culture. It's our culture, too. It's moved into our cultures. It's not, it's not isolated. See what I mean? And so we have a, a bit of a harder problem. Um, and we have to choose not to honor, not to honor the culture over God. And uh, listen, with, with all those things being said, listen to the Holy Spirit's prompting and don't excuse evil in your life. Do you know how many times... Purge the evil from among you appears in the book of Deuteronomy. Nine times in the book of Deuteronomy. And then he gives you a bunch of laws about how to purge the evil from among you. I think that God doesn't want us to live in sin. See what I mean? I'm pretty sure that that's the take home from that. Um, if, you, if you don't believe me on that, you can read through Leviticus and count up how many laws there are in there. And then read Deuteronomy and count the laws in there. And then read Exodus and count the laws in there. I'm sure you'll kind of get the picture eventually that God doesn't want his people living in sin. Just saying. So, I guess the main takeaway from all that, the conclusion of the conclusion, don't let Satan gain a foothold in your life. 
Um, can I have the Pastor Reverend Randall Santos back there uh, close us in prayer?